Jen Dobre. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. That's right, we've been thin on content lately, so I thought for Christmas and the New Year, I'll try and make a very information heavy and useful video. Now, as you know, the Polish Sabre is my all time favourite sword and always will be. However, a close second is the Chinese military big knife. Yes, it's quite an impressive looking weapon and I'm going to try as best as I can, not claiming to be an expert or a Sifu, but just a very enthusiastic amateur to make a comprehensive video for everyone on the form, applications and basically everything you need to know to get started with this weapon as it is a very basic weapon to learn and like I said I'm more an expert but I hope everyone can learn safe and I hope we can have some fun. Anyway, I'm going to try and wrap this up and make this a very fast and informative video and break it down so you can learn in step-by-step -step lessons how to use the Chinese military big knife which is also known as the Chinese war sword. As previously stated, the Chinese military big knife or Mo Dai Do in Cantonese or Wu Da Dao in Mandarin and I ask forgiveness for Chinese listeners if my intonation is incorrect, it's been a while since I spoke those languages, is my second favourite weapon. Now there's many reasons to love this, it has aesthetic appeal, it is a very distinct and good looking sword. It also contains so much, you know, just punch, it just cuts through tatami very easily, it has a lot of chopping power. The techniques for the weapon are also, which we're going to cover today, are very simple, effective, easy to learn, so you can pick it straight up and get going. And it has quite a storied history, and as I'm not an amateur historian, and I'm not going to pretend to be, you can look that up yourself because I'm going to try to pack as much into this video as possible purely about the technique and we'll get started now with the basics which you'll need to know just for those who are unfamiliar with Chinese martial arts or martial arts in general and then we're going to get into learning the form step by step with applications. Hope you enjoy. Alright. The very first thing we're going to talk about now is footwork, or more specifically the stances used in this form. Now these aren't all the stances used in Chinese martial arts, just the ones particular to this form, so I'll cover them briefly. The first is the most basic everyone's familiar with, the horse stance. The feet are double shoulder width, the knees are bent or the thighs are parallel to the ground, and the toes are pointed out in a natural comfortable angle, not exceeded or squeezed in past the line of the knee because that would put a bit of pressure on your knees. Now, more often than not, you'll stand inside on when you use this. For obvious reasons, you do not stand like this in front of someone and the height of it can vary on what you're comfortable with and naturally when you're fighting, especially with a weapon, the stances are often kept high and loose. The second stance is this front stance or mountain climbing stance, there's numerous names for these, I'll just use very common words to describe them. They're comparable to a lunge in western fencing, now basically your knee does not exceed the point of your toe in this plane because if you go past it not only does it put strain on your knee for just day to day performance but it also makes it hard to withdraw. So here we are. The back leg is straight, you're pushing forward with it you push with the ball of the foot in all these stances, never with the heel. Some people, for some reason, think traditional stances involve pushing with the heel. Like I said, it can be a high or as low as the situation dictates or as you're comfortable, but the structure should remain the same. The third stance we're going to cover is the empty step, bolt step, cat stance, whatever you wish to call it. Essentially, all your weight rests on one leg, the other leg just hangs there. It's more of a defensive stance, you might pull your leg back, you might prepare to go off of it, but it's just a position you hit. All these stances are transitional, they're between movements. It creates a structure that you move from one to the other. You don't just stand there in front of someone in this goofy deep stance and be stuck on the spot. It's a misconception that 
that's the way people used to fight. It is basically part of the movement. Which brings us to the last one we'll look at, the cross step, which is the most misunderstood stance in classical martial arts. Now, it can be as low or as high as you need. The main rule here is the front leg is turned outward, the back leg is behind, and the knee stays on this side leg. You don't have your legs crossed like this, it's always this way. We'll discuss how this is applied later when we talk about applications, but like I said, that's a very misunderstood move and I hope to clarify it a bit in this video. Now we'll move on to the next thing you need to practice this form. And that would be your own Chinese war sword. Now basically I've got a very nice vintage one here, not World War II vintage, more closer to 1970s model. Now although this weighs in at over 1.3 kilos, it is incredibly maneuverable, even with one hand. That's because it's very well balanced. You have a bit of weight at the back here. A lot of distal taper. You have a thick slab up by the handle, but it gets thinner towards the end. Now you can buy a very nice one. There's numerous sellers. I can't really recommend any of them because this is the one I've got, which was um, purchased in Asia. And I don't even know who the manufacturer was or if they exist anymore. However, if you want to cut stuff in your backyard with it and have one you can like swing around as well and learn with, I would recommend, purely because it's so economical and so handy, this cold steel machete version. Now, if you just look up cold steel Chinese Warsaw machete, this will probably come up. They are readily available, unlike the cold steel Warsaw, which I don't have, so I can't comment on the quality or not. not. And basically, yes, if you just want a cheap, cheapo one to swing around, chop stuff in the backyard, this will do the job. It does not have any distal taper, it's just a flat steel sheet, so it's not going to handle as well. But it is nowhere near as heavy as a real one, so that kind of negates that factor. So it is very handy to get one and use yourself. Now, when it comes down to it, if either option is unavailable you can just resort to swinging stick like a caveman no no doubt i'll do this later when demonstrating the um applications as i don't have a unsharpened practice war sword you can buy plastic ones on the internet or you could just get like literally a like a fencing board like one of those and cut it to shape pretty easily all you do is just find a shape of life on the internet and just copy it so now that we have our stick sword or whatever we're going to use in hand let's start practicing i will demonstrate the entire form for reference now at a fairly relaxed pace so that it's clear not like these people who just blast through a form they go okay did you get all that we'll just take it easy and go step by step from there the form i'm demonstrating here comes from the northern chinese kung fu style called seven star praying mantis the name of the form matches the name of the weapon it is simply called military big knife now this rather unpoetic name matches the unpoetic movements which unlike some other you know forms are not flashy flamboyant and dance like they're very basic and rudimentary it's worth noting that if you practice this at a more frantic pace and make the movements flow together rather than the stop start and gentle pace I'm doing here, you can complete this form fairly quickly as it is rather short. Uh, it's also worth noting that if you have access to more room you can make the steps longer, advancing and retreating over much more ground, or if you have less space you can make the steps shorter and basically stack them on top of each other to save space. If you have a katana but no access to instruction, although not as refined as katana techniques, this is definitely compatible with that weapon as well. And uh, here I make a mistake, but since we had no light and my wife thought it was funny, I didn't do a second take. The most logical way to break down this form for purposes of learning it is into lines, as in you start, you go up, that's one line, you turn around, come back, that's another line. This one you go up and back three times, so it is six lines, so we'll have six basic lessons. So we'll get right into the first line, the opening. Now, you stand relaxed. The sword is at your side, quite obviously sharp edge facing outward. How you grip it's up to you, I prefer between the thumb and middle finger, 
with the index running down the handle but you could have it grip like this between the index and the middle finger or this way if you please not very important so we're relaxed and ready you come to attention stand up straight puff your chest out a bit fist gets chambered concentrate look which way you're going from here we turn lowering it and grasping towards the top of the handle up here at the guard with our right hand allow the tip to drop take the back with your other hand and sit back into our empty stance while raising the tip till the sword is held pretty much directly in front of you in a vertical position now this bears saying when you grip the sword don't hold on to it with your hands like this or too far like this line it up so that the V made by your fingers naturally go get this sounds pretty obvious but it bears in mind that anytime you're holding onto something with two hands having these this natural V between your thumb and the rest of your fingers lined up will give you the most comfortable grip now the handle is rather wide so after a bit of experimenting you'll find which width obviously we don't hold it close together but some people hold literally over the actual ring Others hold right up at it. I sort of hold right up at it, but each their own. Depends on how big the old hands are, and the mechanics of your swing will basically feel easy or harder, depending on the width. Experiment for yourself. First position. The second position. We throw out a very short, tempo-like cut by stepping forward into the front stance, doing a bit of a lunge, and you push forward with the right hand and pull back with the left to strike out. From here, you turn the hands over while raising them slightly to chamber the sword for next strike. The back foot catches up to the front foot and you strike out as you sink your weight chamber it again lift in it and then step forward again into that front stance as you strike out the mechanics of the strike are pretty simple besides throwing it forward with this motion you're also as you chamber it for the next strike you always raise it up a bit as you do so your chest rises your stomach relaxes then as you cut down your stomach closes a bit you tighten your muscles you pull down with the lat muscle and pull a bit of weight into it now we don't over swing all the way down here you stop the swing then we repeat the very first motion drop the tip rise the tip up Again, push forward and pull back for a short cut, chamber it, catch the leg up, second cut, chamber it again, catch the step forward to a front set and weight down and hit hard. So basically it's the same three cuts which are very important, repeated and that's the first line. And it's worth noting too for safety considerations so we've started in this position we've struck out you chamber it you always do that with the leg to the rear we never chamber it this way here because you might catch the leg so i'll slice down flip it over to recycle for the next strike i don't step forward too early into it as i flip it over also i don't walk in this way here you catch up very close by so here, we've chambered it, caught up afterwards, struck out, chambered it, and then as you step forward, come down. You never step into your own like rotation for obvious reasons. You do not want to cut your leg. Here we are in the uh, good old training room. Stick in hand, apprentice ninja present, 
and we're gonna go through some of the applications. However, one thing I want to touch on first, and I want to mention this now because line one movements are the perfect example of what I'm gonna say, is that there's two types of Kung Fu. There's the old fashioned way of wielding weapons, and there's the new modern way, sometimes called Wushu, and that teaches wielding weapons in a very different way. For it, and the line one weapons movement is exactly a perfect example of what I'm talking about. The way I showed just a moment ago is the old fashioned way, where you cut, withdraw, cut like this. Cut like this. Now, in modern Wushu, rather than cutting like this, which there's a pivot point in the middle of the sword, they will cut with a pivot point at the wrist. And sometimes, because they use very thin, like sheet metal weapons, they're more like stage props rather than a 1.3 kilo war sword, they'll even let go with this second hand, twirl it literally quick, and then just grab it at the end. Also, with the footwork, while I am showing step, step. They'll just turn it into like a giant leap and then sink low into a stance. Both of these are impractical. Now, the reason why having the pivot point at the wrist twirling, not only is it weak, but we're gonna find out in one second why having the pivot point in the blade is more important. But also, when you step, it is equally impractical to leap because once you leap like that, you are committing to the entire movement. If you step, then step, you can change your mind because a fight is not fixed. You might strike out and think, oh, I'm gonna get this guy the next strike, but then they come at you, things change, and you have to withdraw. So you have the option to improvise because things change in a real fight. But anyway, that's just what I want to touch on briefly, the difference between the way I perform and my Wushu person might perform the exact same movements. Now, let's get into the movements themselves. Movement one, raising the tip. Essentially, this is your guard against horizontal strikes. Performing exactly like the form isn't gonna save you because I can still get cut across the old shoulders. So in order to make work, I rotate to the direction the cut is coming from, from my waist. I do not move my arms across like this as that is weaker than staying there bracing with both arms. So if you brace it in the middle, it'll always be the same structure regardless of which side comes from this turn to face it. So if my katana wielding assailant here comes at me, I turn to face the strike and see if I keep in the center, I would have been hit. That works either side. Yep, other side. Exactly. Now, one thing to keep in mind, I did say you have the hands at the belly height rather than you don't raise the tip up like this. Because if, don't do it too hard, if I'm to be cut on this side and I'll hold it up here, something very obvious is going to happen very badly to my hands. So we have the hands low. We are protecting our torso with the blade, creating a wall to either side of our body by rotating as the strikes come. Now, this parry is also useful in the movement phase, not just bracing it as a stiff area. For example, lifting it, if I've got my tip down, whether I've struck and finished my strike or whether I'm standing to face my opponent this way here, I don't have the blade up in front of me, I'm standing to face this way. If a thrust comes, again, I basically raise it and rotate depending on which side I catch it. So it's the same shape, but as it comes, sit back and rotate. This is a way to deal with thrust. So thrust comes, I sit back and rotate it away from me, almost like I'm trying to make the thrust fly over my shoulder by lifting the blade and sitting back. 
It's kind of game, so she was a quick thrust to not move back and try and stop it this way. But that's why we always sit back with that, because you want to also move your body out of the way to buy you a bit of time as well. Movement number two from this position is to cut out with this kind of tempo pushing cut. Now this logically follows what we've just done. So let's hold the sword out. So regardless of whether I've blocked the thrust or a cut or whatever I've done, from here while her sword's offline, I can quickly come at them with that. So it's just literally block, respond very fast, just like that. Now, that little cut might not be as spectacular as some of the massive swings we do later on in the form. However, it's in the first line and it's the most important because with a with war sword, literally that will just split their head open if you strike them that way. And it doesn't have to be after a block. You can be any time we're ready, we're facing each other. I can come at them like this as my opening move, like a jab in boxing. It doesn't expose me too much. I bring the blade forward in front of me. I've always got steel protecting me. And her response, I can always sit back to a parry or a hanging guard or anything, depending on what she does. It's a good way to check her or your opponent. Might not necessarily be a woman, I would hope not. And it's just a way you can very quickly open the fight with a strike at their head to force them to respond without exposing yourself too much. That's the push cut. So we've done our small cut. The next couple of cuts are very comparable to cross cutting with Polish Sabre or and many other disciplines as in we're slicing one, like basically we're cutting down horizontally like a cut one would call that in Western fencing. We're Mulanane, but a double-handed Mulanane, and we're cutting down the other way. We do this a couple of times in the form, and always, as I've already said, coordinated with footwork. And you don't have to do that order in real life. You can chop and change, do it in any order. You can go left, right, right, left. Anyway, you can double up sides, which we're going to do in a moment. But it is a relatively grug-brained way of fighting, because... What we're actually doing is we're responding to like, for example, her number one cut by cutting back into it with number one. We're just cutting into a cut as our defensive maneuver. Now, if we do it forcefully enough, bang, and we knock her offline, then we can just move on eight and come in with a few follow-up cuts. So we're relying on the blade presence. Now that is the weight of the blade, as in the Chinese, war sword weighs 1.3 kilos, most katanas are significantly lighter. So when we're in a bind, with blade against blade pushing, the person with the heaviest sword usually has an advantage in this situation. Blade presence is my ability to enforce my will on them purely by having the heavier weapon. Now, yeah, Yes, the weight of the stick has prevailed against the child. <laughs> so, as you do this, you're a lot, you're literally just swatting their strike out of the way. And like, if we knock it out of the way, then Mulanane, in, cut in, Mulanane, in, and cut in. We're basically just cutting through. If she has multiple cuts of me, I throw multiple cuts back to her. It is a very... Like I said, it's a very simplistic method and it relies on having a heavier sword and just always going forward and always exercising power and crowding your opponent with just cut, 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 cut. You can do it any order. <laughs> However, what if she's been hit in the gym or she's brought the heavier sword to the sword fight? And I can't just ha ha ha, slot around like, suddenly I'm falling, whoa, I'm being <laughs> overpowered here. She's doing to me what I've been doing to them. Well, this is where it's important to keep the pivot point in the middle of the blade, rather than just doing the wushu twirl, comes into play. Now, this is kind of 
this is a bit more subtle and less like grug brain than what we've just done as in if we're here and she has more force than me and if I collapse she's gonna get me basically rather than collapsing I'll rotate my tool up let her go and then come with that way so what we're doing is basically rather than one side two side we're going one side one side again so we're doubling up on one side so you double up on one side if you're getting overpowered. So if we hit here, oh shit. That's so fast. Now this will work as long as you keep, we'll do a super slow. No, don't push too hard. As long as you keep this here, there. If I rotate at the wrist and try this, if I like, don't hear me, if I rotate the wrist, I am going to get cut. So here, if I rotate at there, that's how it works. That is why having the rotation here by raising your hands like this, rather than just doing this, is important. As quick and as impressive as that might look, it is useless in this situation. Line one ended in a lunging front stance, striking out with the sword. Line two is just retreating. It's like similar to line one, as in it's virtually the same motion repeated. So the way we begin the retreat very rapidly, rather than pulling our weight back up off of this foot, we essentially just reverse it. I'm in the front stance facing this way. I continue to look that way. However, I reverse my front stance so it's facing the opposite direction. This removes my body from this area immediately pulls me back as I pull back I raise it to a hanging guard we don't put the hands over the head or the body we put the blade over the body whenever we do this hanging guard so I lift it up then you can sink just a little bit as you strike down now we use a cross step and you can do it as a little bit of a skip in which over one and then another front stance this way and we repeat hanging guard and strike low then we finish line two by turning the tip is already down and same one raising the tip now where we, we raise the tip Keep in mind, it's not up here. The hands are about belly level. And that's the end of line two, how to perform it, that is. So, line number two. We've had a lot of fun chasing someone with cuts in line one. Now it's not so much fun, we're running away. That's all line two is. It's the exact retreating method used twice. Now, essentially, there's two different ways to look at this. One is... If you've cut and missed and you are vulnerable to their counter attack and you want to pull your body back, you can, your weight should be on the front foot, you can push up and back off of that. One very way to quickly retreat a bit and get yourself some ground back is to basically reverse the stance and use the rotation rather than trying to pull the weight back that way. So that's what we're doing here. So I've cut, I've come under pressure, so I'm guarding high as I pull back. Now, from here, if I'm under pressure, I can try and sweep and go at them, but there is always a danger that she can disengage and just come at me still. So, one safe way to strike while you're running away, rather than trying to go back out, is if I'm under pressure, oh, I'm up here. So we're going to try and sweep it away, target either their hand or their leg or whatever's available while still keeping out of the way and then we run away and try and get some space so we can try again. So basically that's all line two is. It's a method of running away while attacking because if she's in a deep front stance, yeah, like lunge out. Here, her leg is going to be more accessible than her body. So usually just going for their leg and that also stops them chasing you if you manage to wound their leg, even the slight wound on their leg 
may slow him down because essentially here we're getting out of the situation by running away. So we begin line three in this position we should be familiar with now. We start same as line one by going to a front stance and doing that pushing cut and turning over to prepare for another strike. However, this time the strike is slightly different rather than projecting out this way. We have the hands almost fixed and we basically instead of catching up, we step around while bringing the blade down here using more shoulder than like hand motion. We're not doing this. We got it down here. Once we're here, step behind with that cross step, draw it in just one continuous circle over and then bring the weight down. As you bring it, you can extend the abdomen, raise the shoulders and then boom, just sink and put a bit of force on that strike. Then we take a little shuffle step like this, just front foot, back foot. So we start and end in the front stance still. So we've done our big shot. We do that as we do a hanging guard and then without moving, rotate it over the head and cut directly horizontal at neck level. We don't cut like this or like that. We throw it out with the arms straight for maximum reach. So from the front view, that would be a hanging guard. Once again, not this, but this. Rotate over the head and then cut at neck height this way. And we should end just this part, uh, this side of the center line, not in the middle, not all the way over here. We're not over swinging. We're just cutting to basically almost in line where our opposite shoulder. And that is the end of line three. So line three has two combinations. The first one is exclusively for dealing with a long weapon. Now in the olden days, it would be a spear like this having the era of the Chinese war sword, it was probably more like a rifle with a bayonet attached. Now, basically, we can use a combination from line one to deal with this. For example, I can use the first shot to try and swat her spear, the second to try and take her hand, and the third to try and finish the job. Creeping closer with each strike to try and get past this. Have a swat in the spear tip away is sometimes a dangerous game because she can just disengage, make a quick circle under. And it's like someone with a rapier who's very good or a foil. You think you can hit the tip out, they'll just circle it, disengage and thrust you and you are stabbed through before you know what's going on. So the movement here in line number three is as we come down, to, we press the spear down and keep it down. We step past the tip so she cannot stab me again. We get crowd them, we get past the tip. So now if she uses the sideways, I'll be facing stick. So we hold it down as we step past. Now, this is a little bit tricky, a little bit risky, but if we get to their back and we're past the tip, we use that momentary opening to turn right around raise our sword and have enough strength to basically come down as hard as we can and finish the job. So turning your back on an opponent is in a movement is always, always risky. However, this way here, we're basically, we're trying to press the tip and walk past the actual danger area in front of the point before we do it. And then as we do it, we're trying Maintain that contact for as long as possible, break and try and cut them before they have a chance to do anything back. Now, the reason why we're doing that on this side and we don't do it so much on this side is because if I cut down on this side, step past and come around, all she has to do is raise the middle of her spear as a block up high. Yeah. So they still have a lot they can do. Now it's not game over for me. 
I just haven't gained as much and it definitely works on the other side a lot more easily. But still, turn your back's a high risk move, so you got to really get this one right. And yeah, that's basically the movement in action. Combination two in line three is relatively straightforward. My opponent does a perfectly vertical cut. I crowd it a bit, allow it to slide and then strike horizontally at my target of choice. It could be their head, neck, shoulder. Either way, I'm going to open their brain, maybe make their head bounce off, or at least remove their ability to use one arm depending on what I hit. Now, we step forward a bit simply because her, old, her like ideal area of power is like here. That is gonna be the harder, that's gonna have the most force in it. If I step forward a bit down here, there's slightly less force. And you gotta keep in mind the limitations of the Chinese war sword. It is short, it is shorter than the katana and many other swords where you can see the blade that goes past the handle. The handle, like it's a long handle, but the blade you work with is shorter and more for chopping. So it's, you want to get in range. And if you can see they're coming with a vertical strike, then you crowd it, you approach them, and then you out slide off and try to be very close to that cut. It's a lot better for this, like considering the length of the blade. And I've mentioned this before, you do not do a hanging guard with the hands in front. Here we do it with the blade. We use the blade to create a barrier between us and our opponent's strike. Not our hands and the handle. Now, we'll go a bit of an angle. This is a fairly obvious point. If I do this, yes, I am going to lose some fingers very, very quickly. There is no guard on the Chinese war sword, especially not for this hand here. Some of them have an S guard, but that's traditional, not the World War II era, which we're talking about. So you create the wall between you and your opponent's strike using the blade, not your hands and the handle. And while we're here, ideally, <laughs> Ideally, we want it at a 45 degree angle, so she cuts here. If we have it too long, chances are that she can still reach us and collapse us. If we have it too high, she can hit that and skate off and go straight into our body. So you want it about 45 degrees in this direction. So, line four begins very similar to line two, as in it is two retreating movements and they are identical. Now, we'll just forget about the sword for a second, look only at the footwork. You turn at the waist, you pick up this foot, it sets down as the other picks up and you land into a front stance a fair distance from where you started. So, to practice that again, Turn at the waist, pick the foot up one, two, and land like that. As we're doing it, you've struck out this way. As you turn, the sword comes. You can touch your back or not, but it's basically flat to your back, high overhead, abdomen extended. You see it up a bit high, and then as you drop at the end of the jump, cut down. A perfectly vertical strike kind of similar to what you do with a katana and then you repeat that so you've done one you've cut down back up on your back as you turn leap and then cut down now i'm doing them a bit small because i'm limited for space but when you do them if you're going to go for it make the jump long not high so i'll do one a bit longer so if I start here, as I turn my waist, I should end back here. So I should end well out of reach and a fair distance, almost like an entire stance length away from where I started. So when we've completed the second one, we've sat down, went down into that perfectly vertical cut. We turn to face the front. 
and then we sit back and raise the tip in the position we are already familiar with. From here, we then step forward into a front stance while pushing up into the hanging guard position which we are also familiar with. Then, we lower the blade, turn it over, and then we lift it again into a reverse hanging guard while twisting our body into a cross step position. Then from here, cut down and make sure this cut isn't thrown forward. The hands stay fixed and we're cutting down slightly different. The hands should be lower than usual and you should sink a bit with the cut and have it more or less 45. And that is the end of line four. All right, line number four. Like line two, every move is a defensive move. Now the first one is similar to what we do in line three, as in I've finished an attack and now I'm running away backwards. However, here we want to sort up, we do a turn jump and retake the ground in front of us. I must admit I'm not a fan of this move. Now in line two, we reverse the stance to move our body back slightly and try a, a cheeky little low strike on their leg as we run away. In this, we are basically just leaping out of the way and then just retaking the ground in front of us where we're contacting them, their weapon, nothing at all, just basically point our sword out in front of us. We basically, as soon as we hit the ground, we're coming down with a powerful strike no matter what. The reason I'm not a fan of this movement so much is because for obvious reasons, you turn your back on the opponent. Now, all the movements in this form are just ideas. They're on the table for you to take or leave as you will. This one, I probably wouldn't take so much, but obviously the creator of the form thought it was a good idea because they put it in there twice, because you repeat that twice. So rather than running away, you're ripping your way up and jumping and turning to retreat straight backwards. Now, I said to make the jump long rather than high because you minimise the risk of turning it back if you're moving away from them super fast, jumping back that way. But still, like I said, it's not exactly my favourite movement. After this, we, we hit three different defensive positions. The first two we're familiar with. So we're here, turn this one here. Done it several times, very important, we've already discussed it. Secondly, this one here, hanging guard. We've done this several times. Again, we've explained it already. The third position is this one here. Reverse hanging guard in a cross step. Now we just hit this position. However, in real life, you'd move a slightly different way to get to it. Now, why are we doing a reverse hanging guard? Now, obviously, when my opponent and I are fighting, not every hit is going to land. So if I've missed with a shot here, if my tip is below my, my um, hands and they're coming at me from this way here with a horizontal shot, lifting up might not be quick enough. I might not be able to get this in time, especially if they come past my tip as they're swinging I can't get there to protect me. And that will not end well to me, as you see. So if my hands are lower, and then my tip, and they're coming there, raising my hands and catching it this way is a quicker movement and gets me there. The tip does not have to come up. I lift my hands and catch it this way, here. Now, obviously, we do the cross step here because if you can imagine, I've cut missed. They're coming at me this way, that's too slow. I'm doing this. This movement here is not 100% strong, so we'll step away with our back foot like that, and then you can come back or do whatever. So when we're here, if our legs are relatively apart, if I want to go that way, if I go one move, this leaves this leg out. So if I want to move my bow back this way, if I go this way, that leg, it's one move, rather than having a one, two. Now you might say, here gets me out of the way, and my leg is there, 
because we're hoping their sword will slide down this off and my leg is still in the path of that. If I merely go like this, I've left my leg behind to be picked up once they slide down. So hopefully if we do this, their sword will slide down and catch nothing. And then we can turn and bang. Because if you do this correctly as well, it's kind of like circular strafing in the game. I've come here, I should still be the same distance to them, but they're facing that way. So if she does it slowly, we'll come forward a bit, huh? So my tip's down, she comes at me, I go here, she slides her sword out of the way, I can go here. She's facing that way, my leg is not in line with the strike anymore. I'm back here. So I've changed angles on her, which is the main point of the cross step is here, just hold your sword out, is to change angles in one smooth, not one, two change angles, but just one. And my angle is completely changed, which leads into the next movement. The next movement is one which you need good timing for. Basically, we've done our hanging guard here, and then we've done this position here without changing our footwork. What's up with that? Again, we practice position static in the form, but if we both cut each other at the same time, there's basically, I've got her, she's got me, it's a draw. It's a draw in which we are both dead. So if the same thing happens, we've cut each other and we've hit each other, if rather than just cutting the stand in here, I, as I'm cutting, step crossways this way here, change my angle. Again, she's cutting thin air and I'm cutting her. And this is not necessarily gonna catch her, sometimes gonna catch their hands, but essentially what this defensive position is, is if we're both hit and I change angles as we cut by cross stepping out of the way, and as with the other one, if I merely step to the side and do it, I might catch her, but she's still possibly going to pick up my leg or thigh or whatever. Whereas if I cross step behind as I come down, I'll like change the angle and hopefully get her. But this is one you can only do when they're coming at you. I can't just like wait for her because if I change angles too soon, she'll know what I'm doing and she'll adjust accordingly. Ah, oh, no. So, at the end of line four, we have concluded in a cross step and the hands are rather low, 45 degree shape cut and we're looking this way. Now, all we do is we pop up and jump turn and land in a horse stance while doing another cut over this way. Now this is similar to the cut we've just done, as in you don't throw it as far forward, but you more use arm shoulders and a fixed grip to drag it down rather heavily. So it goes like this. We're started here, jump up and down. So as we jump, we lift it, land in the horse stance other side. Now they're identical movements. So basically they're here, actually don't know. sorry, they're here, up, up. Now the next move is a little bit tricky. We turn the blade over while stepping back to cross step, lift it in that reverse hanging guard, strike down while preparing the front step into this stance here. So when you link it all together, it's a little awkward, but basically we've landed this direction, cross step back, turn as you cut this way here, turn it over, step in the front stance, and the usual cut projected forward. After that, we tuck up, 
repeat the same process that we're used to from line one. Then we turn and we're hitting that vertical guard position, but now we're facing backwards to where we started. Now from here, bring the feet together as you do this reverse hanging guard on this side, slice down, chamber it, and now we do something peculiar. We step and put our weight and power more into the offside cut and project that forward in this front stance facing backwards. So to recap that, we are facing this way, vertical guard backwards. We turn while doing a reverse hanging guard, push slice down, recycle for the next cut, and step forward this time about left foot forward in front stance while we turn and throw the cup forward. From here there's only one more movement. We turn it back in a circle over our head and rotate into horse step facing that way with a cup that's more or less horizontal. You do hold the blade at an angle, you don't hold it out here, it's still fairly short. But basically what you've done is, we've cut this way, we're basically slightly to this side of our body, rather than recycling it this way, we turn it and then cut that way, as we turn our entire body into it. And that concludes part five. All right, so line number five begins with two leaps, which are actually relatively vertical. So basically do a 1A cut, 1A cut. Now this cut, it's not projected outward, but it's more of a sinking cut. It's more bracing it this way and in front of you there rather than here. So what this is, is relatively simple, similar to what we just done. Basically you're ready, ready, ready. The other person's ready, they come at you, you just cut with a jump to the side, you're trying for them to go that way. You're trying to change the angle. So if my opponent's over ah, here, if my opponent's here and I'm here, if I try and cut this way, it might not do much good. But what I'm doing is, I'm jumping this way, trying to cut as well as still keeping some saw between me and her to try and keep my base covered. Now, Although we do a 180 in the form, that's the most exaggerated version. We don't have to do that far. So it's usually from this grip here. If she comes at me, I just jump this way. I can jump all the way over here. It's basically just a way of when someone's pressuring you to change the angle with a single leap while throwing an incredibly aggressive cut towards them. After that so we've done cut one, cut two, we sit back here and we basically do the reverse hanging guard combination. It's only slightly different. Here we are basically hitting the reverse guard or stepping back, chambering and going forward again. It's just a variation. All the movements work the same as previously stated. It's just a different combination. Then ready, we go through one, two, three cuts from line one, same thing. Then we do something a little bit curious. We basically change to doing this one. However, with our left foot forward. Why would we do that? Well, it functions exactly the same way. However, sometimes when we're fighting, we might do a passing step backwards and end up in a left-handed stance. So we just practice this at least once so that we're familiar with fighting from the left-handed stance. So we go one back to here. Now, the functionality of this is exactly the same. So we've gone here, we practice the hanging guard on this side, 
We basically practice striking as we tuck our leg. And then we practice something a little bit different again. This time, right where every single, the, we end most of the combos with stepping forward with our right leg and putting the weight and the power into this cup. All we're doing here, all the movements work the same. How we're practicing basically passing step as it's called in fencing. What a passing step is, is if I lunge this way here, I get a certain amount of distance. However, if I lunge with my opposite foot, I get that much distance. It's a different move. So we're going one, two, many times. Here, we're going one, and then lunging with the opposite foot. Why? Because you should be able to, if the situation calls for it, do a passing step lunge because that's all we're doing here. And you can mix and match. For example, if I cut this one here and chamber it, and they're retreating by seeing opening, I can do a passing step rather than just going one, as we've previously done in here, I can just passing step to make my advance so much more. Pretty simple stuff. We complete on something called a beat in Western Pensin. Now, what this is, is if my opponent has their sword out and they are not doing anything at all, this one starts from this side here, but basically, yeah, have the tip pointed at me. I basically beat their weapon out of the way and attack immediately. Now, the way this works is, we do a similar thing where we do cut into cut, try and beat it back. But the way a beat works is, I try and hit their sword as hard as I can out of the way, and then use that opening to hit them. That's what the beat is. You break their guard by swatting their sword away. The first shot is not necessarily aimed at them, but at their sword. So if she has her sword up again, yeah. So I must follow the beat immediately. Because there's no point beating her sword out of the way. I won't do a hard this time, I swear. If I beat her sword out of the way and go, ha, 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 and then try something, she's going to be ready. So the beat must be followed immediately. And we usually follow the beat by just continuing the movement. If you go one, two, it's not as fast as one, one and hit them. So that's how beat works. That's and scary. Well, not for us, we're just playing around in our front room gym with some wooden yeah. sticks, not their swords. <laughs> Line number six, lucky last. So we've concluded with this powerful horizontal cut here. Look, I'm trying not to trim too much of the old uh, grapevine, but we turn, and again, rotating the entire body, into a horse stance this way while throwing the sword around, circle overhead, and cut. Now, this is a very hard move to do, slow. Do it properly, so sort of cut here as we go, like that. Basically, the, the first circle precedes you, and then you sink into the second circle. The first one we reach out, the second one, again, it's not as far projected, it's kind of tucked and really braced hard. From here, look this way as you return to this reverse hanging guard. Now, this is subtly different than what we used to do in the cross step. Pull the foot back as you slice down, and then momentarily after you pull the back, step it forward again to sink the weight into this projected cut. Now we return to the position you're very familiar with, pass it back to the grip at the start, stand up straight, get ready, and relax and lead. So that concludes the actual form itself. So lucky last, line six. We've concluded with a beat on this side. Now, if you notice with that beat, we use the back 
the blunt end of the saw to knock it out of the way and then cut. Now we just do another kind of bead where we use the sharp edge and cut, but the principle remains the same. You smash their sword out of the way and advance with a cut just straight after all as one movement. You cannot delay because there will only be a moment you knock their sword down, they're going to try and bring it back up. So you've got to go before they bring it back up. So we've done our, we've turned around, we've done our feet, we've retreated, practicing the hanging guard again. One, two, three. There, and you conclude the set. So that's it. The last bit, the last movements, or ones we've practiced before, you're doing hanging guard, cutting, exactly the same as we've mentioned, and just a little beat there, super powerful one too, because this one you want to really rotate your waist and just bang. Anyway, those are the applications for line six, thus concluding the form itself. Well, there you have it. We've come to the end of our very first attempt at a long form tutorial video. Like I said, I don't claim to be an expert or a Sifu or some world renowned authority. I'm just a very enthusiastic amateur and I watch a lot of other amateur people on YouTube and enjoy their videos and learn from them. So I thought, you know, before we get back to our usual shenanigans of just slicing stuff up in the backyard for fun, we should at least try and do our own little video, try to share some of the knowledge we may or may not have. And I hope you've enjoyed and got something from it. Anyway, this is the part of the video where I usually conclude by uh, slamming the shot of vodka and saying Nazdorovye. However, considering the uh, subject matter of the video, I thought uh, I might change beverages this one time. I have uh, this here I got from a uh, local business and we're going to give it a try. Oh, it smells very pungent. I at least haven't been a full trader. I have got my we were over shot glass here, so uh, let's give this a try. Anyway, instead of saying Nazrovie today, I'll say Gambe. Oh, has a kick to it.